All right, gentlemen, let's get started. Um, so today we're going to talk about label propagation on graphs. Well, in fact, um, the next couple of lectures, um, those lectures will be really about machine learning. And, and these are uh, machine learning application um, to graphs and networks. So um, as far as remember, you guys had at least, you know, two different classes on machine learning, correct? Do you guys have classes in machine learning? Yes. Uh, supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised learning. All sounds familiar? Okay. All right, so we're gonna talk about that today a little bit. Um, in general, this, we'll define what label propagation is, um, the, the problem, and we'll talk about um, you know, two classes, two big classes of methods. We'll talk about collective classification methods um, and, and consider one simple method from that type, which is called iterative classification. Just sort of the simplest, the, the most intuitive approach you can think of. And then we'll talk, uh, the, the majority of the lecture will be devoted to um, semi-supervised learning approaches. And we'll talk about um, random walk-based methods. Um, we'll talk about uh, graph regularization and a few more approaches. So um, first of all, um, what's label propagation? Well, it, it, it's, you know, it is what it's called, right? It is um, labeling of all nodes on a graph structure if you're given a few nodes with labels. So if you look at this picture, uh, so what we have is we have two nodes, uh, this node and this node that are positively labeled, you know, that has a label plus, and there are two nodes negatively labeled. And, and so the question is, if we have that information, <coughs> is it possible to predict um, labels, or, you know, in this case, so coloring um, of the rest of the nodes? And, uh, um, you know, in fact, here I, I I show you two classes, you know, the one class is um, plus and the second class is minus. So it is a typical binary classification problem, um, but we can do multi-class classification doing like one versus all, um, or there are other ways to do it. Or we can actually run regression algorithms, um, assuming that on every node you have some value associated with it. And the question would be, um, how that value, well, the question would be interpolate those values across um, the entire graph. So it's really, you know, full gamut of machine learning problems, uh, but now you work um, on the substrate, you'll work on top of the graphs. So again, label propagation just really means extending labeling to all nodes on the graph. And, and you know, the, the question is, well, you know, the, for this to work, um, we need to make some very important assumption about nodes connected by edges. Um, so what do you think the assumption should be? I mean, what's, when can we actually sort of propagate, propagate or spread labels? What sort of the, the key assumption we need to make for any sort of label spreading approach to make sense? What do we need to assume about two nodes that are connected by an edge? I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of, when, when you look at this picture, you might think that it does feel natural that, you know, if I, if I start talking about the sort of class propagation, or in this case, you know, there's a blue and green color, you might want to say, okay, well, you know, this node is connected to the two blue nodes, then it's probably, you know, should be blue, right? Or some sort of shade of blue. Now, when I do that, what do I actually assume? Which two nodes are connected? I assume that the edge carries notion of similarity. Two nodes are connected if they're similar. 
because um, if that's not the case, there is no reason whatsoever to label this graph, this node blue, if the neighbors are blue, right? The only reason I sort of implicit, I, I thought about it is just because I thought, okay, well, if the nodes are connected, they should be similar. They should share some sort of trait, right? In this case, the color. Um, and, uh, and this is a key to this whole story. Um, this, the structure of the graph can help um, to determine labels and values of uncolored nodes only if linked nodes are correlated. Now, they also could be uncorrelated. I mean, they, they could be like positively or negatively correlated. Um, that doesn't really matter. We can you know, work with both um, situations, but they have to be correlated. Right? If, they're in, if the coloring of the neighboring nodes is independent, which means you know, coloring is entirely random of the graph, well, there is no way to predict um, the, the, the values of the node colors based on their neighbors. Right? Does, that, does this make sense? OK, good. All right, so the good news in many networks that we work with, this is true. So in particular, um, we, we talked about this uh, last module, I mean, last semester, that um, you know, social network in general show um, assortative mixing, which means that there is a bias to connecting nodes with similar characteristics, right? And in social networks, it actually came from sort of two different factors. One, um, it's homophily, which means you know, people tend to you know, be friends with people um, who have the same characteristics, right? So um, it's also called birds of feather, um, sort of the, the, the similar people become friends. And the other reason is influence. It's sort of opposite reason. Uh, when the two people are friends, they're connected, um, that there is an influence happens, and uh, they can also start sharing characteristics in the sense, you know, somebody, I don't know, Democrat versus Republican, well, if he gets a lot of friends um, who are Republicans, he becomes a Republican eventually, right? Or, you know, shared hobbies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in, so in social network, we do observe a lot of assortative mixing, um, which means that the labels of the nodes that are connected of the friends, they might be, they could be correlated. And by labels here, I can, you know, we can mean a lot of things. It could be um, simple things like, um, again, like, like political preferences. Um, it could be actually even say, you know, the, the town where people live or university they go to, or uh, it could be an age because, um, you know, again, a lot of people, the majority of the friends will be sort of around um, the person's age. And so that means, again, making assumption that nodes are connected uh, because they're similar, then we can try to apply some sort of, you know, label propagation scheme and predict labels of unlabeled nodes based on the labels of their neighbors. Okay? So that's sort of, you know, the, the core of the idea. And, and in general, you know, you would, when you think about this problem, if you have, say, a bunch of nodes and you do know labels of the neighbors, you know, it's sort of almost no-brainer to, to predict the label of the, you know, the, the node in the middle, in between here, uh, by somehow, you know, averaging the labels um, of, of nearest neighbors. Now, the situation becomes a little more complicated when, um, let's say, here is a picture and you don't know, and you know labels of nodes that are further away, and on top of it, let's say, you know, other nodes can have, say, different labels. And so the question is, now, if you want to predict you know, label or the coloring of this node, it's getting a little bit more complicated, right? You need to spread the influence. On one hand, it has two red neighbors. On the other hand, you know, looking at this picture, probably <laughs> might be bluish, bluish. So um, you need to figure out sort of the color in between them, right? Or if it is, again, um, just two labels, well, you can actually uh, assign probabilities um, for this node to have different um, labels. So what we're going to do today is we're going to 
you know, try to uh, you know, look at few algorithms that allows you to do these things um, in consistent manner. So first, some sort of framework. And again, uh, today we'll speak the language of machine learning. And, and uh, um, you know, we'll get a use sort of traditional, very traditional notations. Um, if we think about this problem as a supervised learning problem, so we have, um, what we have is a graph. So we have a bunch of vertices. And every vertex, um, I'm sorry, we have, we have a bunch of vertices. And uh, some of the vertices are labeled. And again, I'll just show some, say this with red color, right? And um, this will be V sub L. Uh, the set of vertices that are labeled. And the rest of the vertices are unlabeled. So for labeled nodes, for labeled vertices, we'll assume that we do have well, labels, right? So we'll call, double, uh, we'll call it Y. And so we'll be, YL is all set of uh, labels for those labeled vertices. So again, VL is a set of nodes that are labeled and y sub l are corresponding labels. I can call it p here. <laughs> and the, the goal is to find labels for unlabeled nodes. Now, um, today we're gonna be looking, I'll be looking for this y sub l to be from um, binary set either zero or one. Um, but in general, you can definitely, um, you know, look um, at y's to be either real values, and then it's, it corresponds to regression problem. Or uh, we can think of y as being multi-class. Now, if it is multi-class, um, that means, you know, one of the ways to handle this is to think about the sort of y capital as a matrix, as a binary matrix, um, with a vector for every class, okay? So um, you'll have indicator vector for every class telling you, okay, what the, what the value for that class is. Again, sort of nothing new, this is traditional machine learnings. Now, we're gonna also think of attributes that every node has, okay? And, um, you know, the, in general, the label of the node, the label on the node will depends on the node attributes, right? It's again, machine learning stuff. So you have a bunch of um, attributes or features, right? Um, typically, you know, you do it like X1, see XN, this is your features, and there is a label corresponds to um, the nodes, so a bunch of features and a label. So in the case of social networks, those features, let's say we want to predict uh, political affiliation, um, you know, whether somebody is Republican or Democrat, and the features could be, you know, place of birth, um, could be age, could be, uh, uh, you know, whatever, right? So you can think about a lot of things can, that can be features in this case. So the features I just described are usually called local features or node features because of the features of that particular person. But one can also think about link features. And link features will mean the information, the features you can actually build from the node structure. Like for example, you know, uh, a feature could be a node degree. So, you know, if you can show that, uh, let's say here, that nodes with degree three always carry color red. So if you know the, the degrees are, are correlated with the label, well, then the degree of the node is a feature. But the node degree is uh, um, is a feature that available only from the graph. Okay. So um, these are sort of graph features. It could be node degrees. It could be various connectivity patterns. But mostly, more importantly, it could be labels from the neighbors. So what you can do 
if we want to set up a like, very classical machine learning approach, is to set up a predictive problem where we want to determine the label, say, of this node. And to do that, we need to find features for that node. So the features for that node would be some internal features and also labels of the nearest, of, of the nearest neighbors. So we can take those labels, in this case color, and encode it as a feature. If we do that, we can then just run very much traditional supervised learning to calculate um, the, 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 the labels on the nodes. Okay, does this idea make sense? All right, now, will this always work? So again, the idea is to use labels of the, of the neighboring nodes as features in a classifier to classify the node with unknown label. Now, this is the question is, will this system always work? No. Okay, so when no? When not? Have labels. As what? The nouns and labels have labels, for example. Or we are uh, on the, at the edge of the graph, the labor file. Right, yeah. So this, this sort of the simple um, structure of the problem I have proposed to you will work only if they're the neighbors do have colors already. Let's say if I want to classify using this approach, if I want to classify, say, this node, right, nearest neighbors do not have any labels. And so, um, you know, I, I cannot uh, predict, I cannot use sort of the labels of the ne nearest neighbors as features because we do not know those labels, okay? Now, you can, of course, say, ah, oh, well, yeah, fine, you know, let's use all the labels, you know, as, as a features, I'm sorry, the features like labels of the next nearest nodes. But, you know, this is sort of, yeah, you can try to expand this coverage. Uh, but it will be a little bit inconsistent. And again, remember, um, we talked about the fact that, uh, you know, the, the edge represents similarity. You know, when you go two steps away, well, yeah, how important the similarity is on, on two steps. Like how, how far it propagates. So the point is, yeah, we can actually do the, the, the classical supervised learning approach, but we cannot just do it straightforwardly. We probably, what do we need to do? How can we just use it if we have this problem of, you know, unlabeled nodes being neighbors of other node? We can use it iteratively, right? So we can actually just do sort of sequence of steps. Um, you know, we can, we can first predict, say, the color of this node and the color of this node, and then using those nodes, um, colors of those nodes, um, we, we can go ahead and predict the color of this node. And then to make this whole thing consistent, we'll need to sort of, you know, iterate, well, iterate, iterate, and iterate, right? So... For those nodes where we know labels, for, for, for those nodes for who, which neighbors we have labels, you know, we can compute, we can predict um, labels for those nodes, and then, you know, the sort of propagate this by iteratively applying the same uh, procedure. So that's sort of the, the, the whole logic. And in, in fact, um, you know, you can build and you can label graph just using this process, right? What you're going to do today is we're going to say, okay, um, we'll assume at the moment that we do not have any other local features except for link features. So we'll make our life easier. Just um, you know, for for the purity here, um, you know, we, we're going to talk only about link features. <laughs> So it's sort of anonymous graph, no, nothing else there except for, for, for edges, for links. Oh, actually, uh, before we do that, um, you know, I, I should say, 
a few words about the, you know, a few more words about this sort of classification approach. So if we can classify um, feature, if we can classify nodes or labels just based on a node attribute and you know just the attribute that particular node has without you know link structure, it's usually called local classifier. So it's just typical classifier, right? Just says okay, you know. If we have an age uh, of the person, we have um, you know the town of birth, and we have you know his I don't know job, and we have you know his picture posting. We can predict um, his political affiliation um, without looking at his friends. That will be local classifier. Now, relational cl uh, well classifier. It says classier classifier classifier um, takes into account labels and attributes of node neighbors. If I want to predict somebody's political affiliation, I can also look not only at his you know, age, place of birth, and, and you know, his, his education and job title, but I will also look at political affiliation of his friends. And that will be a relational classifier, um, and it operates on the level of single node. And then eventually there is what's called collective classifier um, that estimates um, the, 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 the values for own un, all unknown nodes in the network, applying this relational classifier iteratively. So you can think about the relational classifier as a classifier that works on the neighborhood of the node. It takes the graph information, but works on the neighborhood. And collective classifier, it's taking that local classifier and applying multiple times over the entire graph to classify all the nodes. And local classifier, if we have some extra features, um, you know, we can pre-compute sort of a re-initial labeling. Um, to set up the problem, we can sort of try to guess labeling just based on internal features of the node, and then use um, these guys in the loop to actually compute the whole thing. So that's sort of the, the, the general picture. And what I was trying to say in the previous slide, that um, you know, at, at this moment, in this talk, we'll not use uh, this local classifier. Um, you know, just, just, just to make the story pure, we'll just look at, at the graph structure. So um, relational classifier tells us things about the neighbors. And collective classifier takes that relational classifier and applies it across. Um, the entire graph. And in fact, uh, this is the algorithm, the one I just described to you. Um, it's called a iterative classification method. Um, sometimes the people call it ICA, though I would be careful because um, there is another very, very different technique that is called ICA. Um, so a iterative classification method. Um, what we're given is a graph. Um, and uh, we're given labels for some number of nodes. And, and the question is, OK, well, give us labels for the rest of the graph. And, and so the idea here is the following, right? Uh, we first take the labels that we have um, and the nodes that we do have. And whenever we can, we sort of pre-compute some initial values um, of the labels for you know, the graph. You can randomly guess if we don't know we need to assign certain labels to make this whole thing work. And then what we're going to do, we iteratively recompute labels and update them. So this loop really says the following. Um, we have a network. And uh, we originally have some um, labels somewhere. And so what we're going to do is on the first iteration, um, we're going to compute labels where we can compute. Um, and uh, actually, let me, let me make it sort of bigger. OK, we, can, we compute labels where we can compute them. Um, let's say we can compute labels um, for this node. We can predict it's probably reddish. We can predict for this guy. We can predict. You know, well, for this guy, right, um, this guy also has a neighbor, so we can 
probably predict, we can predict for this, but we cannot tell anything about the rest. Then we go second iteration, and um, we can use now these labels as a features to compute labels here, there, and there. So, so that is a sort of label propagation scheme. So within this loop, we have a sort of four um, every node, every node apply um, this relational classifier. So for every node, apply relational classifier. That's what this thing does. Oh, and, 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 and this is a picture um, I was just trying to draw. This is a picture um, showing how this will work, for example, you know, in case of um, regression. Let's say we have a bunch of nodes, and there is a, there is a value here, um, you know, the value 20, 18, 18, and there are no known values for nodes x, uh, y, w, and z. And so based on the given values, we can predict on the first iteration, we can predict the value for the node x. You know, think about the regression. You know, just sort of, let's say we can do just do sort of majority voting or something. And um, then we sort of assign, and we'll have a label 18 for this node. And then on the next iteration, we'll consider already this node as a blue node with a given label. And then we can predict label on, its, on the node it connected to. And so we'll propagate this label to the node Y. And it can, you know, can continue. All right? So the key point in here, it's clear that the, me the mechanism is a sort of iterative updates, iterative updates on local classifier. And, and the whole behavior of the system will really depend on what happens here, on sort of on this relational classifier. So it will depend on how locally you're going to decide um, the label of the node. So, you know, just sort of from the top of your head, if you have to invent this sort of local classifier, you know, what should it do? Like loc I mean, local relational classifier, I mean the classifier that predicts the value of the node based on its neighbors. So, you know, what kind of classifier can you use? Again, classifier in the sense that, you know, there are labels, um, the labels of the, of the neighbors, right? They can be features for your classifier or attributes, and you need to predict um, the value of the unknown node. You can think of pretty much, you know, any classifier, like you guys familiar with linear regression, right? Are you familiar with Bayesian classification? Support vector machines. Does this all sound familiar? You know them? Yeah, you heard about them, right? So, for example, what would linear regression do? The linear regression, if these are the features, and we want to predict the value, well, linear regression, it's a linear combination of the features that gives you the value, right? So the most intuitive thing to do here would be, okay, well, you know, let's take the values, um, let's take these values, local neighbors, and for example, calculate their average. That is the most intuitive thing to do. I mean, if you want to, if you have, if you want to do um, that, that, you do that if you do a regression, right? If you want to do um, actual classification, well, you can actually either calculate sort of majority vote, which is all right, what's done here, 18, 18, 20, majority vote is 18. So does this make sense? 
if you're like asked right now to actually implement this code, will you be able to do this? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, cool. So let's do it. Okay. All right, joke, but you'll be able to do it later. Um, so, the, the, but the point is clear, right? So, you know, the, you need to create some sort of um, classifier that is, uh, you know, local to the neighborhood, which is called relational classifier in this terminology that allows you to classify a node based on um, labels of its neighbors. And then you will have to apply it iteratively through the entire uh, graph. And you have to do this until things converge. Now, of course, depending on what your sort of local classifier does, this process might converge or might not converge. Right? So the local classifier, I mean, the classifier, this. That this, the relational classifier, the one that calculates, predicts those x's, it should do something reasonable uh, so that the whole thing will, will actually uh, um, converge. I mean, if, if it, for example, just randomly selects colors, you know, uh, there is no way this, this process will converge to something, right? And, you know, later in the lecture, we'll actually see the, the, the algorithm that, that to converge. Now, just speaking about this relational classifiers, you know, the, the easiest one, um, as I said, it could be, for example, uh, weighted vote relational classifier, where, you know, you can, for example, calculate the probability of the particular node to have certain class as a linear combination of the probabilities of the classes for the next, for their neighbors, for neighbors. And, um, if you know definitely that the neighbor has particular class, right, say the blue class, then this probability is equal either you know, equal to one, right? Um, and so you, can so you can calculate the probability based on just average. Or if it is a regression problem, you know, you just literally average. Or you can, you know, do something different and calculate uh, Bayesian do the Bayesian approach where the probability um, of the node coloring will be proportional to the product of the probabilities of the neighbors of the color of the class labels of the neighbors and of course you know like in traditional um, Bayesian approach there's a priori a posteriori there is original probability uh, of, of having particular class and, and so you can build literally sort of any classifier to to use to work as this relational classifier. What we're going to do later, a little bit later, we'll show that with a particular choice of the normalization here, um, there, there we can you can have a guarantee for this whole process to converge, and it has sort of you know, very unique interpretation um, why it works. But you know, as in many cases, it's sort of the simplest thing, which is in order to calculate the value. Say in the sen, the value for the node, you know, you take the values as its neighbors and average them out. It works the best in many cases, right? So you get you know pretty good results just by doing that. Okay, any questions so far? All right. So the the rest of the lecture. We're going to talk about a slightly different approach uh, to this problem. Um, the, the approach that based on this you know, idea of semi-supervised learning. Did you look at the semi-supervised learning at, at the machine learning class? Hmm? Yes. Excellent. So then you know the sort of the, the, the idea. In, in general, in a sort of, you know, unsupervised learning setting, you don't have labels, you have a bunch of data points, and you look for the structure, and you're finding, say, clustering, <laughs> right? In traditional supervised learning, you do have some points somewhere, you do some, you do have some number of, say, you know, labels, for every for some of those points, 
you can try to predict those labels for the rest of them. Now, in semi-supervised approach, um, you do have labels at certain points, but you don't have a lot of labels. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to predict labels uh, for all the points, but you're also trying to use a similarity between unlabeled data. So, I mean, this approach is usually um, important when you do not have very many labels available to you. If you do not have very many labels, then you can try to look for additional information in the, in the, in the structure of the data points um, themselves. So you have a, this partially labeled set, and you know, the, the, the same way as we talked at the beginning of this lecture, um, you have labeled and unlabeled data point, and you have small subset of points that do have labels, and you have a large set of points that where you do not have labels, and you try to predict labels there. And one of the approaches to the summer supervised learning is the following. Based on the attributes of all the points or the features, you actually construct a similarity graph. So you connect those nodes with edges based on the similarity between nodes and similarity of nodes, uh, similarity of points computed from their features. And then you use graph structure to try to predict labels on the rest of the nodes. So you, just re you should realize that this is pretty much the problem that we're trying to solve with the label propagation, except for that we did not build a similarity graph. We're already given a graph. So this problem is, a, is typical semi-supervised learning um, using graphs, OK? In fact, this type of approach um, has a name which is called transductive learning. Now, there are two types of learning, right? Inductive and transductive. Inductive learning means <clears throat> you wanted to predict the label for the points you never seen before. And you know, traditional supervised learning is inductive learning, right? You trade on a data set, you're given a new point you never seen before, you try to predict the label for it. Transductive learning means that you want to predict labels only for those points that are unlabeled and already given to you. So in transductive learning in the sense is like in here, we try to predict labels for the points that are already given, that are already in the graph, and you know, not trying when to predict a label for a new point that will come somewhere. That's called transductive learning. So the terminology here is uh, we're going to use, we're going to talk about semi-supervised transductive learning, and then pretty much any method that is developed for semi-supervised transactive learning, we can use, um, but we'll just sort of cut out the very first step in those algorithms that builds a similarity graph over the data points. Because we're not going to do it because we already have a graph. All right. Make some sense? Yes, no? Sort of? Sort of. OK. So OK, one more time. What we're trying to do here is the following. We, we take a problem of this label propagation, and we'll try to cast it in the form of some very well-known and solved problem. And in this case, it is semi-supervised transductive learning, where um, you, know, you have data points, and you try to predict the labels of the data points based on a construction of similarity graph over them. In our case, we do not need to build similarity graph. We just have a graph structure. And the labels 
um, of those points are, are given to us. Okay? So typically, this transductive learning or similar supervised learning is used when um, you have lots of data points but very few labels. Now, if you have enough labels, you can just use regular supervised learning. If you do not have a lot of labels, um, what you try to do is, you know, you try to use as much as possible the structure of the data. And the structure of the data means similarities between nodes given to you. Let's say you want to classify web pages on the, on the web. Or, you know, you want to classify, uh, again, political preferences of people um, on, on, the, on the social network. The way you, know, you, you set it up with a traditional supervised learning would be okay. There are some labels, say, you know, text, there are text label, there are, I'm sorry, there are some text information about web pages. And then you have editors to go over the web pages and you know, label subset of those pages. And then you use that to label the rest. Now, it will work well if you have a pretty big label set, if your editors spend a lot of time and label a lot of pages by hand. The other approach would be, all right, the label by hand, a small subset of those pages, but you also use the, the, the following idea, that if you have pages of the similar topic on the web, they most likely, they probably connected, or if the two pages connected, they're probably on a similar topic. That will introduce a structure, the similarity graph, and that will allow you to, you know, do better job in classifying all the web pages with a smaller subset of labels. And that's sort of the essence, that's why, you know, people invented the semi-supervised learning. Okay? How are we doing? Suspiciously quiet. When did you guys finish machine learning course? We are in process. But you, you, you were supposed to, I thought you were supposed to have like a previous module or, or two years ago in undergrad, no? In, in undergrad, there were, for, for most of us, there were no machine learning course, and uh, first, the first semester course uh, would be better from teaching point of view. So, we are here in machine learning course right now for third and fourth module. So, we are just adding the So, have you heard about the semi supervised learning before? So, no. no, okay. Uh, well, so, all right, you heard about it now, and you can also ask Dmitri uh, to tell you more about it. But, okay, honestly, we're going to talk today, the rest of the lecture, we'll actually look at the algorithm that allows you to solve this problem. So, again, the key to the semi-supervised learning is that you're not only using features, the node features, to predict the label of the node, but you're also using uh, the, the data structure to predict the label of the node, okay? So that's sort of the key. It's sort of mixture of supervised learning and clustering. In a sort of the simplest, again, intuitive way to, to handle this, I would say the following. Let's imagine that you have a bunch of data points, okay? And um, say there is a bunch of data points. Bunch of data points. And let's say some of them have labels. And I'll color them. There's red and, and green labels. And the, the problem is to predict these labels for, the, for all the data points. And every data point has particular feature set. And based on that feature set, you know, we, you ran something like, you know, PCA or something, and you, you draw those points, and they look like these clouds. 
So one of the ways to do the sort of labeling would be the following. You know, you run uh, your favorite k-means or something. You find clusters here. And then you say, oh, well, you know what? These nodes are very similar to each other. This point is very similar to each other. You know, let's just spread this green label across the entire cluster. OK? And that would make for this, and, and we don't know what to do here. So you know, we'll do red and, and green. And that would make for a semi-supervised, sort, of the, 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 sort of the most straightforward semi-supervised learning approach. Now, in general, semi-supervised learning will make this sort of seamless, this procedure. But intuitively, it's this idea. You look for the structure in the data, and then you, know, you apply labels based on that structure. Okay? And uh, to, to sort of connect this to the graph idea, well, uh, what's done in, in the graph approach, you actually build this graph, similarity graph, so you connect those data points that are similar by edges. And then you have this similarity graph, and you use this graph-based semi-supervised learning. What are we going to do today? We're not going to build the graph. We're given the graph, and we're given some labels. So we, in some sense, you know, shortcutting, we'll use semi-supervised learning without the first step of building a similarity graph, because we're given that graph. OK, let me move forward, and um, we'll see how it goes. You know, you'll have a seminar later. I guess next week, where you, where you look into this. So there are several sort of fundamentally, well, they're actually fundamentally the same methods, but they're interpreted differently. And um, you know, I, I just want to talk about them because they give you, you know, different flavors on how you can actually use graphs to label things. So here is one idea. Um, it's actually a class of ideas. We're going to talk about one method. Um, based on this idea of random walks. So here is, here is a, a kind of, I think, a very cute sort of idea and, and uh, explanation. And in fact, I like it because um, you can either do, you know, hardcore numerical computations to get this method working, or you can actually just do simulation. So imagine that we have um, that we have I uh, know I shouldn't do it this way that this is our graph and we have green and red labels okay and the goal is to label say this node right okay so the question is, what color to label this node in? And one of the ways to solve this problem, and this is sort of the random walk problem, is the following. Imagine that within this graph structure, we have this idea of um, absorption. So the idea is the following. You know, the, you can simulate a random walk on a graph, so you can actually walk from one node to another based on the edges. But when you hit the node with a label, you're stuck there. Okay? So then the walk ends. So you sort of, you have a random walk, but this walk has traps, and that means, you know, when you hit one of those traps, you stop. So, you know, for example, a walk can start here and wander, let's say, here, there, there, hit the red one and stop, okay? Another random walk starts here, goes, 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 and hit the green one, stops. Another random walk starts here, here, hit the red one, stops, okay? You know, makes sense? The idea makes sense? Okay, so based on that, how would it color the, 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 this node? Red. Red, OK. Why red? Because small random walks and uh, red nodes. Exactly. So the idea is very simple. Let's just calculate random walks that starts from a particular point, right? 
and let's calculate how many of them end up in a, you know, trapped in the red node and how many of them will end up in a green node, green nodes. And then just based on that, you know, decide what color your node will be. So the, the, the cool thing here is now when we're starting random walk, uh, you know, it's not necessarily that your nearest neighbors should be, of, you know, of the given color. You can just sort of walk on the graph until you hit one of those colors. Okay? Now, uh, what I just said, um, you know, you can sort of express mathematically uh, through using, you know, random walk matrix. Um, and in fact, what it says is the following. The label, or, well, you're going to talk about the probability of the label, right? The probability of the label will, of, of the label I here, will be calculated as a probability to end up on a particular, you know, node with particular color, you know, times the, the color of that node, if you wish. Now, we're not talking here about colors, we're talking about probabilities. So let's say we, we, we do binary classification. So this node has the value one, um, the label one, this node has a label, say, minus one. And uh, which means if we're dealing with probabilities, this is just, you know, vectors one and, and, and ones. And this is a probability that you start from node I, you end up on node J, in sort of infinitely many of steps. I mean, we, can, we can define if you want to, you can say, okay, you know, in 20 steps or in 10 steps, or you can actually just calculate it, you know. In math, in, in, if we use formulas, we can just uh, assume that T goes to infinity. If we do like simulation, you know, we can restrict T to be some large number, All right? And so if instead of um, writing, um, you know, writing uh, values per node, I just use the vector notation, what it says is here is the vector of the labels I need to get. This is the matrix of probabilities to end up on, um, on different nodes. And um, this is the matrix of the labels, I'm sorry, the vector of the labels on, that, on those nodes. So if I can compute this matrix, the probability matrix, then I can, can compute everything, right? Um, and again, what's important is that labels, um, the vector of labels is actually split in two parts, you know, labels, uh, the, 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 the nodes that are labeled and the nodes that are unlabeled. Okay? So what we're gonna do now is very similar to uh, what we actually done before with page rank. You will be surprised, you know, how many of, well, it, actually it's not surprising because uh, in, in both cases, whether we did page rank or here, it's all based on the sort of Markov theory, um, random walk, really nothing, nothing else. So here is a sort of key to this process and um, I'll spend a few minutes on, on this slide. So, First of all, random walk matrix, right? If you have adjacency graph, an adjacency graph, you can always build a random walk matrix. And let's do the following. Let's say we have, um, okay. Let's say we have the following graph. I'll have a line graph, and let's say here is we have A label, and here we have, um, B label, right? And um, I will number nodes one, I'll actually number this node two, and this will be three, four, five. So pretty much based on the idea of this sort of random walks, uh, what color node three should eventually get? Hmm? Red. Red. red, right? Because, you know, if you, it's closer to the red node. And so if you start randomly walking from the node three, you know, you're, you're most likely in more cases will hit node A 
than node B. But you still might end up in node B a few times. So what we can actually do is we can calculate the probability of, of node 3 ha to have, you know, either color red or green, so the type of A or B. If we look at the node 5, most likely will be B. You know, if we, node, if we look at the node 4, it's most likely that the probability it has color A is one half and color B is one half, right? So to simulate a random walk, um, we need this sort of random walk matrix, but before we do that, um, I want to do a simple modification to this graph to follow this idea that the nodes that do have labels, they're sort of trap nodes, which means, you know, when, when the walk gets into there, it cannot get out. To do that, um, I, I will enforce this sort of one directional, directional edges coming to those nodes. And, um, but the random walk should never stop. This is sort of the, 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 the idea for the Markov chain. Um, if, some, if some walk is trapped in the node, you have to add the sort of self loop. And this will allow me to simulate what I just talked about. If I start, if we start, say, um, you know, we start here, you know, the random walk gets to this node and just stays there. It's trapped. Okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to write uh, this matrix, random walk matrix. So I'm literally going to do this. Okay. In fact, this D minus one A, we, we used it before. We used it for page rank computations, right? We used it for random walks when we talked about random walks you know, several lectures ago. So to do to write this matrix, I'll just do one, two, three, four, five. Um, one, two, three, four, five. I'm actually going slowly through this because um, you know, it, in this sort of course of networks, this is probably one of their key things you need to remember, okay? So what are we gonna do here is the following. Yeah, I'm gonna fill it in um, by different sort of probabilities here, right? So what's the probability to get from node one to node one? Node one is, is this node. Well, it is one, right, because it's self-loop. You cannot get out of this node. What's the probability to get from node one? Um, again, this is node, this is one, um, sorry. This is one, this is node number one, this is node number two, three, four, five. So what the probability to get from one to, um, to one? Well, it, it's one, right? There's, this is the only way. Um, and the probability to get from node one to any other node is really zero, okay? Node two is this guy. So what the probability to get from node two to node one is zero. What's the probability to get from node two to node two is one. What's the probability um, to get other nodes? Zero. Node three, what's the probability to get from node three to node one? So from node three, you can go either to the left or to the right. So what's the probability to get from node three to node, to node one? Remember what we do, right? We, we look at the random walk where it is equal, equal, equal probable to go to follow any edge. So what's the probability to go to the left? Versus to go to the right. One half, right? Because it's, it's random walk on graph, edges are unweighted, so it's equal probability to go left or right. So probability to go from node three to node one is one half. From node uh, three to node two is zero. Node three to three is zero. From three to node four is also one half. And uh, here is zero. If I start with node four, um, the probability to get to node um, to node one is zero, to node two is zero, probability to get to node three is one half, 
we're not staying on node 4. Probability to get node 5 is 1 half. And if I start from node 5, probability to get a node 1 is 0. Probability to get to node 2 is 1 half. Uh, 0, 1 half, 0. Any questions how I filled out this matrix? OK, notice something interesting. So what I've done here is these are the nodes that are absorbing nodes. These are the nodes uh, A and B. This is the rest of the nodes. And, and so what it says here is, OK, if we start a random walk uh, from node uh, 1, it always stays in 1. If we start from node 2, it always stays in 2. It cannot get out of those two nodes. But other than that, you know, you can walk. Okay, so this is what this formula means. You can split the nodes into you know, two categories. The nodes with labels, like here, A and B, and, we'll, and I will call them PLL. It is this part of the matrix, sort of labeled nodes. Now, this part of the matrix is a connectivity between labeled nodes and unlabeled, the probability to get from labeled to unlabeled. This is from unlabeled to labeled, and this is from unlabeled to unlabeled. Now, the, the part of the matrix that corresponds going from labeled to labeled is diagonal. Here it is. This is diagonal, right? The only value is non-zero on the diagonal. And here they're all zeros. OK? So the question is, what's going to happen when I take this matrix and do p to the power n, which means p times p times p times p times p n time, and then send n goes to infinity? Well, do you know what's going to happen? Hmm? Yes. We'll stop at one of the uh, we'll stop at A or at B. So I would recommend you if you never seen that, how it works, you know, type this matrix in MATLAB and just multiply itself, you know, twenty times. What you're going to see is this matrix will actually eventually converge. And um, as a result, you're going to get the following. OK, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, we're going to get, so of course, nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to change here. But these guys will become zeros. And right here, we'll get uh, from the node, OK, from the node, just, uh-oh. Uh Hello? Sorry. Let me correct this. So three, four, five. So from the node um, three to node one to node A, you will get probability three fourth. From node three to node two, you'll get probability one fourth. From node four to node one, you'll get probability one half, one half, and one fourth, three fourth. So the point is, uh, just by sort of assembling this matrix, taking it to uh, you know, some high power, which means, you know, repeating this many, many times, you will eventually get um, saturated probabilities that will tell you, okay, 
what the probability that starting from node 3, you will end up in node 1, which is a label A, or will end up on node 2, which is a label B in our case. And so for node 3, you will get the probability 3 halves to be type A and 1, and I'm sorry, 3 fourths to be type A and 1 fourth to be type B. And if we assign label based on the maximum probability, well, this will become red, you know, and, and this will become green, and, and, and this one, well, it's 50 50, right? Okay, so the, the, the entire idea of this approach is that when you have a random walk and you have absorbing states, eventually all the walks will absorb in those states and you can actually calculate the probability for a walk starting at a particular node to be absorbed in a particular node. Um, and if you, we can affiliate, we can use those probabilities of absorption to label the nodes from which the random walk started. All right? OK, so let's do this. Um, we actually do not have a, uh, we do not have a seminar today, a lab today. We're gonna, we only have a lecture. So what we're going to do is the following. Um, we're going to take a break right now for uh, 10 minutes. And we're going to continue after the break. We have more material on this topic. OK? All right. So I'll see everybody in 10 minutes. We'll continue from this point.